Welcome in, everyone, to the It's Official Podcast. Every Tuesday, it's Jeremy Plonk and Jeff Siegel for First Bet and Express Bet, tackling five hot topics. We do it every week, but this is Breeders' Cup week, so it's so much different. Welcome to those of you watching as well in the first Breeders' Cup wager guide. We're embedded in the guide, and you've got all the handicappers surrounding you for Breeders' Cup 40 coming up this Friday and Saturday at Santa Anita. We will tackle five topics as we do each and every week, but these topics are kind of wide ranging and they have a lot of tentacles to them this week, Jeff, because we've got 14 championship races. We do. We have lots to discuss. Uh, <laughs> some of it good, some of it not so good. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second, but uh, uh, we reaction to the draw, of course, uh, yesterday. Uh, we heard from from uh, your, your opinion yesterday, Jeremy, mm-hmm. I've got some uh, things uh, I want to uh, point out as well. Uh, talk about race shapes. You know, that's a very important mm-hmm. part of handicapping, as you mentioned, uh, over the over the months that we've been doing this, the years right. maybe now. Um, races can change depending upon what how the pace is. And we'll discuss mm-hmm. what races might change because of that. We'll look at some key workout races. We'll look at some uh, price chances and maybe horses that are going to be overbet. And now we're going to look at the uh, the future book that uh, it will be has been released and will close tomorrow or Thursday, I should say. Mm-hmm. Um, but all of that is kind of taking a back seat uh, to some of the news that uh, was related this morning that was not yeah. uh, not good at all. No, a couple big items, right? Uh, practical move. The winner of the Santa Anita Derby this year, three year old who was on the comeback trail towards a potential start in the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile, had a cardiac event this morning and ended up passing away. Uh, the Tim Yak Teen Barn, obviously, uh, torn up today. And uh, this is the kind of news no trainer, no outfit, uh, no owner, nobody associated with a horse uh, wants to get. Um, so a very somber morning to start things off at Santa Anita with that news that Practical Move has passed away. Uh, just, uh, you know, condolences to everyone around him. And then on a less severe note, but still majorly impactful, it was ne- next that the news broke that it's uh, an, it's over for the career now of this year's Belmont Stakes and Travers winner, uh, Archangelo, who would have been one of the favorites for the Breeders' Cup Classic, a race that's just had nothing but bad karma over the last week or so. The Classic now has not only lost the Belmont and Travers winner, but earlier lost the Haskell winner uh, in the ill-fated uh, Go Rocket Ride uh, you know, injury. And then prior or just after that, Mage was announced out of the uh, Breeders' Cup Classic. So the Classic has lost the Derby winner, the Belmont winner slash Travers winner, and the Haskell winner, Go Rocket Ride. So it's been rough for the Classic division for sure. Uh, Foot problem, uh, had not trained over the past two days with Archangelo. They ran out of time. An injury you would think maybe you could come back from, obviously. But, uh, Jeff, the retirement announcement came immediately thereafter. So... Uh, things obviously with stud farms and deals are in the works before these horses are finished on the racetrack. So when something does happen, uh, they're pretty swift to move in these areas. A lot of times we will not see Archangelo as a four-year-old now, uh, and we will not see him on Breeders' Cup Day. So a rough, rough news day here on Tuesday as we record our podcast. Very rough for the connections of practical moves. You remember the same thing happened. I mean, once is enough. Once is bad enough, but twice. Same thing happened before the Kentucky Derby. Yeah. But the Kentucky looked like he was a major contender following a Santa Anita Derby win. Yeah. I know it was a two or three days before the race. It was announced he had to be scratched. It was the week of the, of the race. I know yeah. that. Um, comes back. I can honestly say, Jeremy, I thought he was the surest winner on the program as far mm-hmm. as I'm concerned. I was looking forward to wagering on him. He had trained unbelievably well. His comeback race was better than maybe any race he ever ran in his life. <laughs> um, and and to have this happen um, just a few days before the race, sudden death as it was, and on the heels of what ex- happened before the Derby, I don't think any owner uh, deserves this. I mean, it's just, you know, it's one thing if, you, if you're a major stable, if you're a Godolphin or whatever, you know, you can, there's always tomorrow, you know, right. But for, for connections that only have a handful of horses and likely will never have one like this again, it's cruel. Really it is. And, mm-hmm. and I feel so bad for Millie and Tim and good people who do things the right way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, forget about the gambling aspect at this stage. Uh, right. I mean, uh, it, it's just not fair. It really isn't. And I've had it happen to me as an owner. I mean, when we, 
we had the scratch practice, um, a political ambition the morning of the British Cup in 89, which mm -hmm. a race on the mile that I thought he couldn't lose. Mm -hmm. um, and he came back later. And uh, But that's just, that's the racing gods being cruel to you. Mm -hmm. And as far as uh, Arcangelo is concerned, you know, with the passing of Arrogate, who was developing into being a very successful stallion, right. now he takes the mantle from the, for, for those that, you know, loved to arrogate and thought uh, that uh, he was going to be one that would be a, a top stallion for years to come. Mm -hmm. So his best son goes. And I don't know whether this is going to impact the uh, horse of the year honors because Arcangelo looked like he was absolutely sitting on the possibility mm -hmm. of being that, not to mention yeah. the three year old champion. Uh, but they, I guess he, he was worth too much as a stallion um, based on what they were told uh, to uh, bring him back. So, I mean, it's still going to be a great race, the classic and all sure. that. Th this is. This is something we fear. Every year we get to the, the, the yeah. Breeders' Cup or the Derby and we lose our stars on, on, on the night of the, of the race almost. Yeah. Got to live with it. Got to gotta push on. And it's still going to be a couple of great days, but maybe not as great as it would have been. All right. That's the news of Tuesday as we prep towards the Breeders' Cup. Let's take on our first of five topics this weekend. The post-position draw took place yesterday at the Pasadena Civic Center in Southern California. All 14 races were drawn, entered. John White's morning lines were set. The post-draw reaction now, Jeff. Winners and losers from yesterday's 14 various post-draws. We've got the fields for all 14 races and John White's original morning lines for those. We'll be able to share them as we discuss some of these contenders. Who do you think maybe got the best of the post-draw amongst the horses you saw? Well, I've got two here. Um, all right. I, mean, I mean, there are others that... You know, are, I'm sure happy with where they're drawn. Right. But the ones that I thought got the biggest benefit, and this usually involves extreme posts, either the inside mm -hmm. or the outside. You're not going right. to complain too much if you're in the middle somewhere. But uh, in Italian, in the British Cup, mm -hmm. Philly and Bear um, turf, uh, lands the rail. Now, you know at Santa Anita going a mile and a quarter, they have that dog leg. And if you draw the rail and you break with your field, you fall into the lead whether you want it or not. <laughs> and Italian, an Italian wants it. I don't know whether she can go a mile and a quarter. I think maybe on firm ground with a downhill run for the first eighth of a mile, she might be able to get the trip. But if you look at the, uh, the projected uh, uh, situation here in terms of pace, she's going to be exactly where she needs to be, the controlling speed, and she's not going to have a, have to spend one nickel to get there. So right. I think as a, if I had it, an Italian, I'd say, yeah, just don't put me in the 12-hole. I'll take anything else. But right. to hand, hand her the one hole, mm -hmm. isn't that terrific? I mean, I don't know if she can go this far. I don't know if she can beat in spiral and the rest of these, but um, she's got a head start to begin with. Yeah, the question is the distance. The question is the competition. But she gets every chance to do that with the pace scenario and with the post. She's going to give her best opportunity uh, to be successful. So she's one of your post-draw winners. How about uh, one in the sprint? I know uh, inside-outside you're talking about. Do you like the draw for Gunite in the sprint? Well, he's outside um, Speedboat Beach. It's a weird race because if you look at it, <coughs> excuse me, not a lot of early speed in the race. I, I, I would think Speedboat Beach will be in front. And I was thinking that if you like Gunite, wherever you are, you'd rather be outside of him. Because mm -hmm. uh, elite power isn't that quick. The Chosen Vron isn't really a front runner. Three Technique isn't. Hoist the Gold isn't. American Theorem, no. Dr. Shivel's got speed, but he's not blazingly quick. Right. So, I mean, here's Gunite hanging up on the outside. He's In his career, he started twice on the outside going uh, six furlongs. Twice he's been out. Um, I think there were seven and seven of seven a couple of times. And he mm -hmm. won both races easily. So this is the kind of spot where Gunite really wants to be. He wants to be outside the speed, outside of everybody, if, if that can be worked out, mm -hmm. which it was here. So he's going to get the all-time trip here. And he's not going to have to, again, do anything other than come out of the gate and land in the perfect ideal stalking spot. That's where he wants to be. So if I'm Gunite, I, I'm thrilled with where I'm drawn. If I can, right. uh, you know, if I can, if I'm good enough, I'm going to have every chance to be good enough. And you talk about a Breeders' Cup sprint that's just not blazing with early speed. I think it's the same kind of story in the dirt mile. And I think one of the winners of the post draw might be Zozos. With the scratch in here, of obviously, uh, with practical move out of the two, not involved any longer, you're in the three-hole. Cody's Wish has no speed at all. Stage Raider's not all that fast. There's not a lot of speed to go in here with Zozos. What a beautiful draw. You know, Florent Giroux and Brad Cox, their MO almost on any of their horses, especially in these two-turn 
races is to get out and go and just try to run them off their feet. Zozos to me looks like a horse who won the post draw uh, amongst the dirt mile horses in here. And with national treasure to the far outside, we never know if national treasure is going to show speed or not. He wired the preakness and we just, haven't seen that kind of speed from him since the fact that he's to the outside there's only eight in here but i think zozos gets to control the dirt mile and he's one of my winners for uh the post position draw all right jeff let's talk about horses who just didn't have the good fortune we've talked about some bad fortune in some really bad ways already on this podcast but less fortunate we should say to not win the post position draw and to draw poorly let's talk about some of those horses who do you want to start with well again we're going with the extreme post you either get buried on the rail uh sprinting which is not good i don't think anybody that that i saw them got i mean uh got victimized terribly there mm-hmm. um but um you don't want to be in the 14 hole going a mile on the grass i mean right. i guess if you're lure you can do it but other than that Carson's run, who I really gave a pretty good chance to. Now, the good news for him is that he's not really a speed horse. But still, when you're 14 of 14 going a mile on grass, you have to be really lucky. Lucky is the word. To Mm -hmm. get over and not get packed wide into the clubhouse turn. And if you're packed wide into the clubhouse turn, you're probably going to get packed wide going into the backstretch. It's just hard to find get over. I mean, you again, you can drop in and maybe – get a good trip uh you're never going to see the rail but um carson's run uh, he might be dead meat before they hit the clubhouse turn that's not where you want to be mm-hmm. if he had drawn somewhere in the middle i would have given him and i still give him a little bit of a chance but right uh, i would have given him a chance based on his canadian form to win this race in a race that the american contingent doesn't look all that great and the euros are good but they're not great i mean mm-hmm. you know so um you don't need to you, you don't need to be giving away anything and Carson's run is going to be maybe giving away more than he should have to the turf mile is the grass race of course the post position a lot of times seems to cause the most angst right it's a full field of 14 the turf sprints reduced to 12 and again you've got two turns to navigate so the other one where you're uh bringing out the 14 hole is master of the seas who's the seven to two second choice in john white's morning line for the breeders cup mile now john had to create his morning line odds prior to the post position draw these were submitted to breeders cup officials before the draw that could impact what you think the fair price on Master of the Seas would be. And from post-14, uh, if you thought he was 7-2 to two on paper, you've got to think he's a little higher than that now. Well, he is going to be definitely higher. And you're right about uh, making a line before the uh, the post. Who's You know you know post positions affect the wagering. Sure. And, I mean, if this if all these races were straightaways, maybe not, but they're yeah. not. And poor Master of the Seas who was second choice originally. And on paper, you could probably say that's where he would fit based on his very impressive win in in Canada. And there was nothing wrong with his defeat at Keeneland. I mean, that's a heck of a horse that beat him. And yet now he's in the 14 hole. And worse than that, he's he's not the kind of horse that busts out there and will get over to the front, but he doesn't necessarily drop back to last either. So what do you do if you're William Buick? I mean, Mm. you just kind of, you're out in no man's land, right? And, right. you know, I don't know what what, what kind of trip he's going to get, but that's got to be in the back of their minds. What do we do? And if he were in the three hole or the five hole, they wouldn't even worry about it. So, again, in the draw, if you're sitting in, if, you know, waiting for the draw on your master of the season, they call 14 to 14, you got to figure, okay, whatever good chance I had, now I have to have that because I don't know if he's that much better if at all. And to give away that kind of uh, that advantage or disadvantage really hurts master of the season. Going to have to be best. Another loser from the uh, post position draw, I thought, starts right off the bat in the very first Breeders' Cup race on Friday, Jeff. The juvenile turf sprint. And that's Slider, the 11 in here. Slider's two for two. And if you saw the prep race here at Santa Anita, Slider completely blew the turn. Coming off the turn, drifted out six, seven pass, and then re-rallied to win the prep race. The Speakeasy stakes under Hector Berrios. 
I wouldn't want that horse to the outside after blowing the one turn uh, that he saw last time. So Slider, I was hoping, would draw down to the inside and have some other horses that can kind of keep him hemmed in a little bit, you know, <laughs> yeah. finding his manners. He's going to have a lot of real estate out there wide likely because there's plenty of speed down to the inside. So even if he breaks well, I mean, you're looking at no better than maybe three, four wide. Crimson Advocate, No Name Mets, Big Evs, all those horses down the inside are fast out of the starting gate. So Slider is probably a minimum of four wide at the quarter pole. And if he trips again, he's not going to make that up. So I thought that was a tough uh, draw for a horse who's got some obvious talent to overcome what he did in the career debut. But these are two-year-olds. They're inexperienced and we don't know that they have repeat bad uh, mm. habits to this point. So maybe that was a one-off thing with Slider and maybe he'll be on his manners with a little more experience. But that's a tough draw, I think, for a horse who you're worried about making that turn. Well, I'll, I'll say one thing in Slider's defense, though. Um, he can't blow the turn and <laughs> to beat these horses. But the good news for him is that all the speed is hooked up on the inside. Crimson Advocate, No Name Mets, Tiger Bell seems pretty quick, and then yep. Big Evs, and they are going to bust out there and go. And the only thing that Slider and his connections have to hope for is they all do each other in. Yeah. And the one thing about Slider's race that did impress me to a point where he did blow the turn and and at the top of the at the quarter pole, it looks like he was winning for fun. At the three sixteenth pole, he, he looked like he was going to finish off the board, and right. then he rebroke again yeah. and one going away. So he might actually draft into a good spot, but he can't blow the turn. I don't know what he's going to do. I have no idea. I would have preferred an inside draw, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. but I could also see a scenario where they all kill each other off, and then he just there they just kind of right. set it up in his lap and he can finish but that could be true for four or five others in the same spot too that is a volatile race i can tell you so those are some of the post draw winners and losers from jeff and myself for the 14 breeders cup races second topic on the board this week is race shape extremes now we talk about the extreme posts inside and outside when we talk race shape extremes jeff we're talking about Really hot paces or really slow paces, and pace makes the race. I don't care if it's a five claimer somewhere or it's a Breeders' Cup championship level race. You give a good horse a pace advantage, they won't give it back. You give a good horse a battle, and a lot of times it'll do them in. Only the great horses overcome the bad race shapes, and it takes a championship effort and just being much the best to overcome a really bad race shape. So let's talk about some of these race shapes that you think are on the extreme side as far as the pace flow goes. Uh, what do you think as races faster than par? Which ones do you think are going to cook? Well, I think the distaff is – there. those those fillies, they're all – the ones that are good are, are front runners. And uh, you see that um, you've got idiomatic. She's got only one way to go. You know mm -hmm. that. Their manner, I don't think she's – I mean, she's stalked slow paces, but she's basically a front runner. Search results, randomized. I mean, these are all fillies that want the lead, mm -hmm. but they're used to going pretty slow. And I think if if you had one, one of them in there, that would be a, a dominant situation. You throw four of them, yeah. something's got to give, Jeremy. I, yeah. I mean, and I don't think – I mean, they all want to be up in the front, and they, they're all very competitive. And I don't see any of them really switching off or wanting to. Mm -mm. So this is a volatile situation. I mean, even who's your filly, if they let her run out of there, I mean, she could yep. be in the first flight for, for sure. So yep. this this race shape, I think, may de determine how the who wins the race. You remember a couple of years ago at Del Mar when they had that uh, the um, the race uh, – uh, the distaff, and they went 44 and change, and the Japanese mm -hmm. horse came out of nowhere right. to one. The whole right. field collapsed. Well, I don't know if they're going to go that fast, but this is one of these races where can I bet like at the five and a half? Maybe I can <laughs> bet right. what I can do there. Um, this is a volatile situation. I'm going to gamble under the assumption that the pace is going to be faster than any mm -hmm. of those front runners want. I could be wrong. I agree. I can, um, but if that happens, you, you, and then you got to look for a closer. And Clarier, who's trained really well, I mean, it might set up for her. Right. So, uh, and and she's due. I think she's running two Breeders' Cup distaffs and has been beaten by a grand total of less than a length combined in the two races. Yep. And there's nothing yep. to show for it. So maybe she's due for some help up front. Uh, but that's the one race where everybody's going to be checking that opening quarter of, uh, or how they look going to the clubhouse turn to determine how this race is going to come out. I'm with you. I'm on a closer in that spot. I think Clarier is the logical closer. The other one, I'm just going to throw a name out there because I think the race shape helps her. 
I've always been higher on wet paint than maybe her past performances suggest. She's going to get a great race shape as the other Brad Cox in here. He, of course, he's got Idiomatic, who's the morning line favorite. Wet paint intrigues me a little bit, but I'm going to need a big price on her uh, yeah. in order to think she can beat that particular group. But she will get the nice setup. Another hot pace, and we already talked about this a little bit because I had mentioned slider in the juvenile turf sprint. Right. You think that one's going to go fast? I've watched on video Big Evs a couple races, uh, and Jeff, this is as fast of a two-year-old coming out of Europe out of the gate as I've seen. He can pop. He's two lengths in front of horses right off the get-go. He looks like a Wesley Ward horse at Keeneland in April, the way that the big evs break. So uh, this one and the speed is to the inside of the gate, right? With the George Weaver horses down on the rail. You think the juvenile turf sprint could go really fast? Well, it will. I mean, I, I agree with you to, to a point where I think uh, all things being equal, big evs is probably the quickest. But Europeans, they don't always fly out. Of, I mean, he did when we saw him running at Doncaster, but that might have been a little bit of an optical illusion because everybody else in the race was a Euro and they never show right, speed. Right. But we know Crimson Advocate. I mean, she won a 26-runner Queen Mary stakes at Royal Ascot going 5 8 You've got to be pretty quick to do that. And she showed very good speed when she won that stakes at Gulfstream. No-name Mets. Uh, he's never been anything other than first in the first call in his race by no-name never. He's very quick. Tiger Bell, they tell me, is very quick. Big Evs, we know, is quick. So there's a situation there where – if what if Big Evs breaks just a half step slow? I mean, right. they, you know, and Crimson Advocate or No Name Mets, they they're American sprinters. They fly out of there. Then mm -hmm. what happens to Big Evs? He rushes up. He takes them. They get into a three or four horse speed duel going into the turn. Then it's anybody's race. Now again, if you took two of those out, or 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 three, obviously, but two or even one out, then you might. Feel, feel that the pace situation wouldn't be as intense. But you throw all four. The inside four horses all drawing in the race, all drawing mm -hmm. close to the rail. They are going to quarter horse it out of there. Yeah. And that, you talk about the break being important. This is going to be it. I think Big Evs is the quickest of the quick, but I wouldn't be so shocked if Crimson Advocate leaves cleanly and, and shows speed as well. That race could set up for a closer. And I'm going to spend the next day or two trying to find who that is just right. so I can protect with it. <laughs> and, and at five eighths of a mile, you might say, so somebody's going to last and win on the front end anyway. But those are the kind of races where everybody in pursuit melts down and somebody big closes at a price to run second. Mm -hmm. So even if you don't have faith in a closer getting there in the juvenile turf sprint, it's a good race to find a long shot finisher who can come along for second. And all of a sudden you're looking at a three, $400 exacta because there's box cars in the underneath spot. So that's a good one to handicap. Now, I don't think the speed in the turf, Jeff, is going to have a major impact on the end of the race. But I think it's going to have a major impact on how the race plays out. I think the turf has a really faster pace than what we're used to seeing in Breeders' Cup turf races. Because Get Smoking is flat out speed in the six hole. And Balladeer from the 12 under Victor is absolute speed as well. I think we're going to see a faster pace than what we're used to seeing in the Breeders' Cup turf. And the reason I think this impacts it, because we're talking about up to the mark who's been an outstanding miler and up to a mile and a quarter. The big question with up to the mark is, can he get a mile and a half against these world-class horses? I think if they like gallop, 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 the longer they gallop, the better chance he might have. I think if this race goes fast and he's trying to track and not come from the clouds, which he won't be in a mile and a half, he could be tracking too fast. If you're going behind, get smoking and balladeer in here. I think the pace of the turf is faster than we're used to seeing. And I think it plays against up to the mark and his chance to get the mile and a half here. The Europeans obviously are absolutely world-class in this year's edition of the turf. So mm -hmm. they go fast. They'll be happy to stay the 12 furlongs, right? I mean, uh, uh, no problem for them. The faster you go, the more they're just going to kind of kick in at the end, I think. But uh, I think it makes it a little bit tough for up to the mark. It, you might be right, and that's why uh, the the, uh, the ride is going to be important. Uh, he he's a good horse that can really kick it in, but you don't want to panic and go into the teeth of a fast pace. Right. You know, if you ask John Gosden about the possibility of of the pace and being fast, and who's the, what's his name? Musta Hop. I can't even pronounce Musta it. Off. I got Musta it today. Off. Last week, yeah, I okay. it nine times. Musta You'd off. ask him, and he said, "What? Well, I don't care. I mean." He won the Prince of Wales from Stone last at Royal Ascot and won the uh, the race at the Judmont International Gate to Wire. So you talk about versatility. The, the morning line favorite at five to two can do anything you want him to do. Just you know, whatever you want him to do, I'll do. Just let yeah. me know before the race. You know, 
I, I, I don't think it's going to bother uh, August Rodin. I mean, I, I think the Euros are a lot less sus- likely to be susceptible to a fast pace. Correct. Whereas your point about up to the mark, basically a miler, you have to worry about him getting a little too keen the first part because mm-hmm. he's stretching out the mile and a half. He's probably in his mind. He don't want to be that far back. But if he's too close to that fast pace, those Euros are they they're unforgiving the final right. quarter for a mile. They they come blasting home and you better be ready for them. What a great addition of the Breeders' Cup turf. You got a dual classic uh, derby winner, Irish Epsom Derby winner, not the morning line favorite. That's how good uh, yeah. this year's Breeders' Cup how, how turf about is. This? How about this, Jeremy? I, the, the champion stakes from Newmarket, I'm tossing them out. <laughs> That's how tough it is. That's how tough. Oh, all yeah. he did was a second in the Epsom Derby, tossing them out. <laughs> yeah. This is Too a tough, tough race for him. You know? This is a tough year for an American who could be as good as any turfer we've seen since Wise Dan, uh, Bricks and Mortar. Up to the mark is fantastic. I mean, he's having, he's horse of the year if he wins the Breeders' Cup turf. I don't think there's any question about it. When you yeah. put together the turf classic on Derby Day, the Manhattan, uh, then uh, the race at Keeneland, the Coolmore Turf Mile, and a Breeders' Cup Turf in a year when the dirt horses really haven't done much and Archangelo doesn't make the big dance here uh, right. for the Classic. Up to the mark can be Horse of the Year, not Champion Turfer. He's Horse of the Year if he wins this field, and he will have earned it, as the old commercials used to say. Yeah. He will have earned it yep. uh, if he beats this particular group. Let's go to our third topic this week as we talk some workout warriors. You and I have... Uh, looked at some workouts and horses that were going the right way, the wrong way in recent weeks. You've got three here that we want to spotlight on a real positive, and none of them are horses that just jump out in terms of favoritism in their particular races. Let's start in the mile, the mile on grass, where it's more than looks. This is a three-year-old colt. He was entered in the Bryan Station last week at Keelan for Cherie DeVoe. They decided to scratch out of that one because they thought they could get into the Breeders' Cup mile. It worked out for them to get into the field. And here's his final workout at Keeneland on the 27th. What do you see? I see. Now I see he's the only one. He goes in 49 and one. How can that be a great workhorse? It's not the time. It's the way he's doing it. He's eager. He's sharp. He's confident. He's going to outwork uh, his workmate here easily. He never asks a drop. He's relaxed but keen. I mean, when I say keen, I mean he's eager but he's not trying to do anything that the jock isn't asking him to do. And that's what I like. And also he's a turf horse working on dirt. So it was still a good, very good work. I think he's going to really step forward big time. I just don't know if he's a good enough or B he's going to get the pace that he needed, but we did see his most recent race. This Colt is improving by leaps and bounds and, he is going to run the race of his life. You as the handicapper will have to figure out whether that's good enough. But I can tell you he's going to step forward off his most recent very impressive win and hopefully uh, maybe even get a piece of it at a big price. That's more than looks for the Breeders' Cup mile. How about fierceness? We'll go back to Keeneland for a work here. Fierceness, of course, last time out, didn't run his race, stepping up in the stakes company. But at Saratoga, he was all the rage, and this is a two-year-old for the juvenile who's going to be a fair price. He's on the inside working with the stakes corner, unnoted. And his last race was a complete disaster from the start. He lunged at the start. He got off poorly. They, they sat off the pace. He, the horse was asked to make a move into the far turn, which was about uh, a quarter of a mile too soon. He started spinning his wheels on that sloppy track, literally eased to the final stages when the situation uh, was lost. But tell me this colt doesn't look sharp. And if you mm-hmm. go back and look at his Saratoga win by a pole, a big 90-some-odd buyer number, this is a really talented colt who, if he hadn't run his last race, if they had just trained him up into this race off his maiden win, would have been probably one of the favorites. He's <laughs> you know, galloping out really yeah. well. I don't think there's a distance problem with this colt at all. Yeah. Um, and he's he's you know, he's being you know just chirped to a little yeah. bit here. But it's a half-mile work that's more like six, three-quarters, seven-eighths, full of run, uh, plenty left at the tank. I mean, all he has to do... Uh, in the juvenile is to leave with his field. And if he does that, man, I'm telling you, he's he's going to have a say in the matter. I, I really believe that. And I don't think they would be running him unless they thought he was doing well. They're tossing his last race out. I'm tossing it out. And they're going mm-hmm. on the possibility that maybe he's as good as his maiden win, which, by the way, the winner-up came back and won for fun. So uh, I got to tell you, 
that's a horse that you got to consider, especially based on the way he looked in the spreeze. That's fierceness for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, getting Jeff's thumbs up in the morning. One more work we want to look at with our workout warriors. How about Saudi Crown towards the Breeders' Cup Classic? The Brad Cox trainee was out on the track working with his distaff uh, staple mate, distaff contender Amore for Brad Cox. Uh, they were at Churchill Downs working uh, this past weekend before heading to Southern California. Well, they broke him off uh, Saudi Crown. He's the gray on the outside, and they broke him off behind a workmate, but on the, in the actual race he's going to be in front i mean there's got mm-hmm. to be the uh the strategy and this is three quarters uh in 12 and one he's going to go out and out i mean look at his stride look at the nice hold i mean you see horses breeze like this down the back stretch breaking off you don't see him finishing like that so mm-hmm. i mean this horse is just i mean he got a confidence building win last time out he's going to step forward and if they hand him the lead and i think the way that the post position will dictate do not think that Saudi Crown is not going to have a major impact on this race. He's a rapidly developing three-year-old, and you put him on the lead the way this breeze was, three yeah. quarters and 12 and one, never taking a deep breath, lightly raced and proving with every start. Man, I, I think Saudi Crown, I mean, I don't know. Is he a mile and a quarter horse? Is he good? I don't know, but I can tell you he's going to run the race of his life. Well, we've been talking for the last, what, three months. Will somebody in the older horse ranks step forward? It's all about the three-year-olds this year, right? And Mm -hmm. with losing the horses we talked about at the top of the show, when you lose the Belmont winner, you lose the Derby winner, and you lose the Haskell winner in the last week or so uh, between Archangelo Mage and then Go Rocket Ride, this is one of the top three-year-olds left, and he's punching, and he's punching strong in the morning, so... Saudi crown one to keep an eye on for the breeders cup classic, the way he's working. That's one of Jeff's thumbs up in the mornings. Let's go to our fourth topic this week here on the big board overlay and underlay John white, the track uh, morning line maker at Santa Anita had the task of odds and morning line pricing for all of the 14 races for the breeders cup. As we mentioned, his morning line does not include the ability to look at the post positions before. So, and you're also with scratches and changes. We're going to see that some of these horses won't go off the prices that they're listed in the morning line. That's the way it goes. Also, morning line makers in big races like this are not making horses 50 to 1 and 99 to 1. They're going to keep them down 20, 30 to 1 uh, out of respect for the connections and working for the event being the Breeders' Cup itself. So everything is, you know, debatable. We want to talk overlays and underlays, but which horses based on the prices we see in the morning line or what we expect would we think will be overlays or underlays. If you're a newer player following horse racing, an overlay price is a horse who's paying over what you think it will. You think the horse should be three to one and he's six to one. So that's an overlay. An underlay is when you think the horse should have been six to one and the price is under that say at three to one. So that's the difference between an overlay and an underlay. Good value, bad value, good value is an overlay. Bad value is an underlay if you want to look at it in those kind of terms. So, Jeff, let's talk about some horses here that you think might be. Uh, let's start with the uh, what do you want to go with first, overlays or underlay? Well, let's go with uh, underlay, okay? Let's right. start off with the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint. Okay. And good, good night, Olive is six to five. And that's what she is in the morning line. And man, I, I, I put her and society really on an even plane. In fact, I, I actually think society is going to win the race. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, she's five to two in the morning line to good night, Olive. I really think that they're going to be closer than that. First of all, numbers wise, society is now has become just as fast as good night, Olive. She's right. coming off two runaway wins. Um, she's won seven out of 11. Good night, Olive has won eight out of 11. So they're both got the credentials, but good night, Olive. Um, was um, a little bit, I think, disappointing to uh, to Echo Zulu. I'm not saying she should have beat Echo Zulu last time out, but she never really looked like she was going to. Now she's right. got the rail going seven eights, which might keep people a little bit away from her for a a, a, a really top class mare who's not all that quick. I, I don't. I mean, she could have run into some traffic trouble if she doesn't come out, and she's going to have to be ridden. Whereas society is on the outside there, she can kind of dictate her pace. The pace situation here looks comfortable, very comfortable for her. She's, you know, a, a distance horse as well as a sprinter, and, and she's never been better. I, I really think I will, I will be surprised, let's put it this way, if those two horse, the two entrants, Goodnight Olive and the Society, are pretty close, uh, aren't pretty close on the tote when it, when it was all said and done. Now, I really like Society, so I'm maybe mm-hmm. 
thinking that more people are going to think like I do. Uh, but uh, I, I don't see good. I mean, you're talking six to five in the morning line. You're almost thinking, all right, even money, four to five, whatever. Right. I don't see good night all of that in, in that in that context at all. I mean, I guess you right. can win, but I wouldn't take a short price. How about you, Jeremy? Yeah, and you're talking a defending champion, right? So there's the name recognition and the notoriety, and people right. will probably lay on a defending champion a little bit more than maybe they should. But the Breeders' Cup isn't like Kentucky Derby Day. There's not a lot of silly money in the pools. I mean, right. it's big pools, but these are people who bet and handicap on a regular basis. It's not a casual audience per se. So I think they will be able to evaluate these two horses more than just saying, well, the defending champion, that gives mm -hmm. her the edge and she's six to five in here. I agree with you. I think the two of them are going to be much closer in odds. And I would not be shocked based on her current form if they don't really go all in on society in that race. I'm, I'm in I agreement agree. there. And yeah. I'm going to throw an extra one in on you uh, okay. off of our script. But I think the same thing matters with Caravelle in the turf sprint. Caravelle is uh, five to one in her title defense. She won the turf sprint last year at 42 to one. I don't think her form this year is as good as it was going into last year's race. So I think she's living a bit on reputation, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. She's the second choice, co-second choice, with a, a big cluster of horses in the five, six, uh, four and a half, the one on Living the Dream. I would not touch Caravelle at anywhere near five to one odds. I think that is a massive underlay on her because I don't think she's as good as last year. You took 42 to one last year. If the, if the people do bet a return champion a little bit harder than they should, then that helps contribute to what we're talking about here, underlays and overlays. There are other horses in this race I like a lot more than that. And for John's defense, Arzak the 12 is a horse who I thought had a big bigger chance in this race at six to one. I wouldn't necessarily argue with the original price, but from that outside post, just, just not, there's not an advantage for Arzak that can overcome that to take six to one. You know, I think you need 15 to one on that horse now from that post, but John did not have the liberty of seeing that, of course, at the time of making these odds. But I, I think the Breeders' Cup turf sprints where we've got a couple underlays here. Yeah, I, I wouldn't take Caravelle at 15 to one. And that's what yeah. Tony Ann is. And Tony Ann just beat her. I don't think, yeah. I don't think Caravelle is the same, Aaron. She was 42 to one last year for a reason. Now, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, in handicapping this race, I start to finish. I never even considered Caravelle on my ticket anywhere. I, I, I <laughs> right. and, and really at five to one, you probably say, okay, well, should I throw in the five to one? Should I use her on a backup? I mean, I don't care what price mm -hmm. she is. I'm not using her. That's just the way it is. Right. I've got others in there that I like a lot better, and we'll talk about one in a minute. But um, I agree with you on Caravelle. I, I, not only do I don't like her at five to one, I don't think she's going to be anywhere near five to one. Let's go to the classic and look at the odds here. Now, this is going to change because Archangelo's scratch at 7-2 to two is a massive change, right? This is the right. second favorite in the race. So all these odds aren't necessarily even calculable at this point. We're looking almost basically like how the horses are ranked, right? First right. favorite, second favorite, third favorite. Which one here stands out to you uh, in terms of being an underlay? Well, I don't like Wida Barrio at all. Um, and she's 4-1, to one, and that makes him – what uh co-third choice yeah um i didn't like the way he was training i i this is even before i i this was like two weeks ago actually and then he had that uh, uh he was supposed to work on a monday then he was supposed to work on a wednesday then he's supposed to work on a friday and i, I saw his last work I, they kind of ridden him out at the end and even if he was 100 percent doing great I don't think he wants to run a mile and a quarter. And the other right. thing about him is I went back and watched his last win at Saratoga I, in retrospect. I didn't think it was as good as it looked originally. You know, I, I just right. didn't think it was, it, 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 I was impressed when he won it, but I went back and evaluated the race and watched it again and watched who was in the race. And I'm thinking, I think people are overselling him. And, and that mm -hmm. doesn't even count the fact that he's had a training that has been interrupted and he's going a mile and a quarter that, I don't yeah. think he wants to run. So at four to one, again, if he's ten to one, I wouldn't even throw him in my ticket at ten to one because right. you know I, I mean I, I mean price has to dictate a little bit, but you still have to like sure. the horse, don't you? Absolutely, absolutely. Now with Archangelo's scratch, where do you think the money shifts around in here? I think Saudi Crown probably takes some of that. The horse we just talked about, who's working so well, obviously Ushba Tesoro, I think is going to take some of that money. And Arabian Night, I think those, you know, I think those three are the ones who are probably going to get bet down of, off of what we see here uh, and take that Archangelo money. We're going to shuffle things around with a field of twelve versus thirteen, obviously. But uh, you've got a lot of percentage of the pool, right? 
right? This is all math. When you take a horse who's three and a half to one out, uh, you know, you're offering up 22 points uh, when you're making a morning line for seven right. to two. So there's 22 more points to be spread around. And, it, you know, they, they will be sprinkled throughout the field, but some horses are going to take more than others. I would assume that Ushba Tesoro, Arabian Knight are going to be solid favorites. These are going to be the two horses everybody leans on, I think, now with Archangelo out of this race. And then you're going to have, you know, a gap between some of the rest. Saudi Crown could come down. We talked about him working so well. I know you think that they're one of the overlays that we want to talk about, not just well, all the overlays here. One of the overlays that you like is in this field. Well, <laughs> I don't know what price Dermot Sotogaki is going to be in. He's 20 to 1. He could win. He could run last. Uh, and mm -hmm. the thing is, because, you know, we haven't seen him since the Derby, but I can tell you this. There's no way I'm leaving him off my ticket because in watching him win the UAE Derby, I thought that was a good enough performance. It was a sens sensational performance to give me the opportunity to back him, stupidly as it was, in the Kentucky Derby. Uh, but, but you know something? <laughs> you know something, Jeremy? You go back and watch that race. Whatever chance he may have had, he lost right at the start. And the fact that he, he finished as closely as he did, he made an extended move. He was right there inside the furlong pole, yeah. paid the price. If he had left cleanly uh, with his field, um, he could have been a factor in that race. So if I liked mm -hmm. him in the Derby, maybe I'll throw him in at 20 to 1 in this race, right. knowing that, well, whatever, it's 20 to 1. I can afford throwing a 20 to 1 shot in it. The problem is I have not seen him work. I haven't, he hasn't had a race. I don't know where the heck he's at, you know. Right. But again, a 20 to 1. I mean, our king, I didn't like him either. And look what he did. So <laughs> right. that was what? What was that? Like exactly 30 years ago, I think it was. 93, yeah, 30 years. So there you have it. So I, I couldn't figure that one out. So maybe I'm not going to let the, this one. I, I will say this. Can you? I want to ask you a question. I don't know if you know the answer. Okay. I don't know the answer, but I don't pay attention to these things. If people, if you're in Japan, does your money show up in the in the, in the the pool here or do they have their own pools there? I believe now they are uh commingled with japan it is commingled For okay this time they weren't but i believe right. now that they are because if it is commingled uh, ushba tesoro is gonna get all yeah. kinds of play right i can i can promise you that um he's really really good i mean yeah. he really is and the thing is that and i do think that um uh, saudi crown is going to get play because i think people are going to look at the form and they're going to say okay he's going to be in front because he's inside uh, of, of Baffert's Colt, mm -hmm. and in looking at Baffert's Colt, Arabian Night, he's got four races, three wins, gate to wire, and one race in which he got a perfect trip, but he didn't make the lead. Right. He sat second in the Haskell and then, then waved the white flag. So if he's going to sit second, there's no guarantee he's going to go by Saudi Crown. And mm -hmm. if Saudi Crown's controlling speed, I'm using him right. at 12 to 1, even though he won't be 12 to 1 now. But to me, he's going to get play. He's going to be uh, probably. I mean, I went into the race thinking even with um, the Derby winner in—I mean, in the um, uh, Archangelo in the race—that that I would I would absolutely put him on my main ticket. Now I'm not going to get the price that I used to be. I still think Ushba Tesoro is going to win it because I think he's extraordinary. Right. So we right. talked some overlays and underlays in the same race. When we talked about the underlays in the turf sprint, that kind of opens the door, right? As the scale tips one way with some underlays, there are overlays. And in the turf sprint, there's one you want to identify in here too. She's 12 to 1 in the morning line, Jeff. Tell us about Roses for Deborah. Well, again, she's going to be in a position where um, she's outside the speed here. L live in the dream is going to bust out and go and pretty much take everybody with him. And he may not look back. I mean, I, I mean, he, he ran well at Keeneland. He paid the price late. I think speed will stick much better on this faster turf course, especially at a five eights as opposed to five and a half. But if you look at roses um, uh, for Deborah, I mean, she had a cata catastrophic situation almost in the, in the last race. She ran on ground that was knee deep in water and she mm -hmm. hated it. But if you look at her form on firm ground, just firm ground, she's as fast as anything in the race other than maybe living the dream. Who, you know, I don't make mm -hmm. figures for that. Um, uh, she's, she ran 106 and change at Belmont when she won there. Uh, she's very, very fast. And the faster the ground, the better she is. Plus, mm -hmm. she shows in the form that she's not really a, a front runner. She's a stalker. And she's got a really good chance to be in a stalking position just where she wants to be over very, very fast ground. Now, if no bows can go out there and keep living the dream busy. Mm -hmm. Who drafts in and sits third? Roses for Deborah can do that, and she could be first over on two horses that might be exhausted going, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
15 rounds against each other at the eight pole. So I think she's overlaid at 12 to one. I mean, she's 12 to one. Caravelle's five to one. That should be reversed as far as I'm concerned. I think Rosa for Deborah is no worse than the fourth horse in the race and maybe even better than that. All right, let's go to our final topic each week on It's Official. If you follow the podcast each week, you know it's Stars of Tomorrow. We're always looking for the next thing coming out of the Maiden or Allowance races. So now you get to put some of that Stars of Tomorrow knowledge into motion at the Paramutual Windows. Live now as we speak mid-afternoon on Tuesday, the pool is open for next year's 2024 Kentucky Derby Future Wager. They're already taking bets on 40 wagering interests towards next year's 150th historic run for the Roses. 40 wagering interests. 39 is the All Phillies. 40 is all other Colts and Geldings. Of course, the Bob Baffert horses aren't eligible to be in this mix for the Future Wager. Here's just some of the 40 horses and the individual wagering interests interest that we've spotlighted for you. Uh, there's not a lot in terms of low prices because with 40 wagering interests and three to five on the all others, it's math folks. This isn't future book like Vegas giving you odds on a team to win the Super Bowl. This is paramutual. So if all others is going to be three to five, there's going to be a lot of 80, 90 and 99 to one types. Uh, these are the morning line odds for Mike Pataglia, I believe. So locked at 15 to one among the individual interest. He's the favorite for the morning line in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. This pool is going to close, interestingly, Thursday at 6 p.m., so you're not going to get to see the results of the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. It's Breeders' Cup week handicapping, but you will not know the juvenile result when you, this pool closes and you bet into it. So uh, interesting that they're taking early action here, Breeders' Cup week, towards next year's Kentucky Derby. Any thoughts on these juveniles looking forward, Jeff? Well, if you're going to bet this early, you might as well take a 60 to 1 or higher, right? You don't yeah, need right. 3 to 5. Better. You can get 3 to 5 any day of the week uh, at any track. You don't need that. Um and I, I think that I like Timberlake at 20 to 1. I don't like him at 20 to 1. I like the horse. And I think right. I could see him developing very nicely. Obviously locked at 15 to 1. But in those cases, you're not kind of wagering so much on how good you think they're going to be. I mean, you're taking the worst of it and trying to figure out whether you're even going to be the same horse and even be in the, in the race uh, several months down the road. So um, I can see – I've got uh, maybe – well, a couple for sure. I mean – Fierceness at 99 to one. I, we talked about him. I mean, right. he wouldn't be 99 to one if he didn't run his last race on an off track. So I could kind of gamble at 99 to one on Fierceness. Sure. Um, Doorknock, of course, is a full brother to Mage. I, I mean, yeah. he doesn't know what he's doing yet, but he's got a lot of natural talent. Mm -hmm. uh, I liked his, his uh, Keeneland win. Uh, I thought, you know, when, when he figures things out, if he can figure it out, maybe by the time May rolls along, 60 to one might not look so bad. So, and then there's a horse named Heir of Defiance, um, right. who is uh, not on this list, but I think he's uh, 60 to one as well. And uh, he was a distant second to Fierce, Fierce in his first time out and came back. And then um, one, I mean, you saw the race, Jeremy. He was really yeah. impressive quality road call. I mean, I could see him develop a, a lot sooner than just May. I mean, he might be yeah. a really important horse in the winter. So those are three that I could see. If you can get prices like that, I would take yeah. them. One other horse that I want to mention is a horse that we featured on the uh, Stars of Tomorrow a few mm -hmm. weeks back, Parchment Party. He mm -hmm. was entered in the street and scratched out of the race because of the off track. Uh, but unfortunately, he's not part of the body. So if I want to bet on him, I got to take three to five with all the losses <laughs> right. I don't want. So that didn't work out. But I mean, maybe next time you can maybe you get parchment party in the in the body of the of the regular horses, and you can get a 50, 60, 80 to one on him. But an interesting bet this time of the year. But again, don't take any three to fives or whatever. Try get a couple of ninety nine to one shots and ride with it for as long as you can. Kentucky Derby future wagering is offered at first bet and express bet again now live on Tuesday all the way through Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern. So if you want to get in on next year's 150th Kentucky Derby, this is the earliest you can yeah. do it mutually uh, starting this week. Our five topics are now official because Jeff Siegel said so. That's the way we play the game here. Our post-draw winners and losers were our first topics. Which races set up for fast paces and slow paces and who might take advantage of that? Our three workout warriors, not necessarily horses that you're looking at as favorites in the Breeders' Cup. Jeff gave you a look at a trio of runners who could outrun their odds based on their morning tips. 
overlay and underlay. We looked at the morning line prices and our projected odds on some horses after some scratches and shifts in fields, which horses might offer value, which ones are going to offer poor value. And we want to try to stay away with a uh, stay away from at short prices and our stars of tomorrow. You can bet them now. It's the Kentucky Derby future wager for Kentucky Derby 150 now open as we speak. That's going to wrap up this edition of It's Official. Jeff and I will be back next Tuesday to do it all over again. We do it each and every Tuesday. It'll be a fantastic recap of mm-hmm. the Breeders' Cup. You can be sure with hard-hitting opinions and fallout on all the action from the 40th Breeders' Cup World Championships at beautiful Santa Anita Park. Jeff's going to be there in his backyard. Can't wait to watch it on TV here on the East Coast. And uh, Breeders' Cup is here, Jeff. We're excited for it. And you and I have got a lot more work this week because our typical Friday handicapping podcast for First call. We're going to move up to Thursday this week. We'll record it on Thursday and stream it out on all the social media channels on Thursday since Friday starts off Breeders' Cup Day. So we move things up just a little this week. I mean, I, I feel I've done so much work and I have still so much work to do. There's always <laughs> some horse out here that I haven't watched the video or watched the workout or inv- looked at the chart that uh, I might regret Friday or Saturday. So I still got plenty of work to do. But I will say this I, I think from a gambling standpoint, um, there aren't any obvious short price mortal cinches, if you know what I mean. You know, yeah. sometimes you, I mean, like with flight line, I mean, you can handicap forever and you're not going to come up right. with anybody other than flight line. But I think some of the short prices this year, the Cody's Wishes of the World, mm-hmm. uh, maybe even uh, Tamara, right. uh, certainly uh, uh, the Philly in the, in the, in the sprint. Um, uh, I, there are Good night, some, Olive, yeah. Good night, Olive. There are some races, horses that are going to be heavily backed that, quite frankly, I don't think has have to win. Right. And right. that, you know, I mean, sometimes you just have to concede three or four races, but I'm not doing that this year. I think not only do I think they might be vulnerable, but I actually like horses to beat them. I mean, mm-hmm. that I like, not by default. So I can't wait to get going. I, I will have uh, videos up a little bit later on in the week. So Jeremy mm-hmm. and I will handicap on Thursday, try to keep our, our best plays and some other things that we can do. Yep. And absolutely, if you're not watching this video on the the uh, the the, the handicapping guide that we put out uh, the breeders cup guide wagering guide uh check it out because it's going to be loaded not just with my opinions or jeremy's we got a bunch of great handicappers who give yeah. you a, an alternative a viewpoint that you might uh, find useful i'm sure you will so check it out and uh, be prepared first.com slash guide one st.com slash guide to download that first breeders cup wager guide jeff and i'll be back on thursday good luck in breeders cup 40 at santa anita